Today's video is another compilation of some of the deadliest caving tragedies we have covered on this channel. From breaking bones, running out of air, or simply losing your diving partner, we cover it all. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And as always, viewer discretion is advised. Before we jump into today's video, I just want to wish everyone a happy new year. None of this would be possible without all of you continuing to watch my videos. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Now let's get into it. Tragedy struck when Harry Hesketh was in an unmapped cave in North Yorkshire, UK, exploring with two friends. Harry would fall and completely break his femur, or the bone in your upper thigh area, and over the next 17 hours, a grueling rescue operation occurred. This is his story. Our tale begins today in North Yorkshire, a beautiful, lush, green landscape filled with agriculture, dry stone walls, and many dales, otherwise known as extensive valleys. The dales are extremely popular for hiking, but underneath the ground are vast and intrinsic cave systems, attracting the best cave explorers across the UK. Specifically in the Dales is Fountains Fell, a small mountain, not very high in elevation, but was historically used for coal mining and lead smelting. Small various pits and shafts remain, but the area is now mainly used for camping. There are many mapped and unmapped cave systems waiting to be explored by those brave enough. Harry Hesketh was a 74-year-old retired computer programmer who was married and had one daughter from a previous marriage. Harry has loved the outdoors ever since he was a teenager. He would spend his spare time climbing, caving, cycling, and hiking. This would be no different later in life. Many close friends and family claimed that the outdoors was what made Harry most happy. Despite his age, he was in great shape and was very healthy. Being an advanced caver, Harry would go potholing, otherwise known as cave exploring, every week, sometimes even twice a week. Throughout the years, he traveled to various locations like Spain to explore new cave systems. Many of these caves were mapped, but occasionally, Harry wanted a more exciting challenge and would explore unmapped caves. With his knowledge and plethora of experience, there was rarely a cave Harry could not venture into. On June 1, 2019, Harry, along with two of his close friends who were also advanced cavers, traveled to Fountains Fell to go potholing. The cave, now known as the Curtain's Pot, was unnamed then and had only been discovered by the group a week prior. They were returning due to their curiosity and the desire to explore the unknown. They aimed to map out this new system and establish it as an official cave. The Curtain's Pot is a mix of horizontal and small vertical traverses that require rope equipment and proper techniques. It also has more standard passageways than one typically thinks of when referencing a cave system. These sections are tight and can have various bends in the rock with only enough space for one person to stand comfortably. There were tiny holes and crevices one can wiggle their way through, but not before getting covered in mud. The Curtain's Pot is not considered a particularly dangerous cave, but it certainly is not beginner friendly either. Remember, Harry and his friends would also be doing this blind, as there was no map or guide to prepare them for what was to come. But at the end of the day, none of this phased the men. In fact, they welcomed it, were excited. These were very experienced cavers. Around 11 a.m., Harry and his friends entered the unexplored cave with their headlamps beaming against the walls. They rigged up ropes and pulleys along the way, making slow progress in their exploration. Occasionally, the men would have to squeeze through tight holes, holding their breaths and contorting their bodies to accommodate against the rock. Many of us would see the small jacket openings and instantly say, yeah, no, but not Harry. Fairly quickly, all of them were covered in mud but they were enjoying themselves. Deeper and deeper into the cave they went. After about 60 minutes had passed since they first entered, the men were right around the halfway mark of the cave. It was at this time that they approached a pitch black vertical drop. Having years and years of experience, the men thought to themselves, cool, a drop, and began rigging their ropes to descend. They pinned the line against a rock, and once it felt secure enough, Harry grabbed the rope, attached it to his harness, and he carefully swung his leg over the edge and began descending into the dark. The men above watched him patiently, awaiting their turn. There was no fear or consideration that something could go wrong. Harry was handling himself well, and inch by inch, 
he descended lower and lower. All of a sudden, there was a loud clank. The screw that was hammered inside the rock and holding the rope came out of the stone. Harry fell straight down into the darkness, followed by a loud thud and then a moan. The two cavers at the top of the drop quickly reestablished the screws inside the rock. This time, they added extra support for their rigging and quickly descended themselves. They were at the bottom in no time, only to find Harry laying on his back. He had fallen about six meters, which is taller than most full-grown male giraffes. Harry's friend had hoped the damage was minimal, but when the cavers attempted to move him, they realized Harry's injuries were worse than anyone could have imagined. Harry had broken his left femur which is the bone in your upper thigh. It is the heaviest, strongest, and longest human bone in our bodies. The fracture was bad, so bad that it had broken Harry's skin and was protruding out. He was screaming in agony and was in immense pain. Being deep inside the curtain's pot, the cavers realized that there was no way Harry would be making it out without additional assistance. The winding passageways, small holes, and vertical drops that they had all easily traversed now stood in their way to safety. Harry managed to stay conscious through all of this, and being the experienced man, he told his friends to leave the cave and call for help. So that's exactly what they did. It took about 30 minutes, but around 12.30 p.m., a distress call was made for Harry. They ended up reaching the cave rescue organization based in North Yorkshire. Once the call was made, one caver stayed to receive the rescue team and assist them from the outside, while the other companion returned to Harry deep inside the curtain's pot. The team arrived quickly, but once on site, they realized that an impossible task stood before them. Since the cave was unmapped, the rescue team could only rely on the description of each passageway from Harry's friend. It became apparent that major engineering work would be required to assist Harry. Many of the crawling passageways were too narrow to transport Harry through without additional rigging, and they simply did not have the manpower for the amount of work that would be required. The rescue team called for help, and many neighboring organizations answered that call. In total, over 90 individuals were on site helping. They were advanced cavers, cave digging experts, and a trained doctor. The advanced cavers and trained doctor were among the first group to enter the passages. Once inside, they remarked that the cave was a great find, despite the circumstances. After some time, they reached Harry, and immediate first aid was provided. He was responsive and answered questions, but due to the severity of his injury, there was little that could be done deep inside the cave. While this was going on, the rescue teams on the surface began rigging the cave to transport Harry out on a stretcher. This proved to be an extremely hard task and was taking much longer than expected. At the same time, two separate teams of cave diggers chipped their way at the narrow sections of the rock. They used battery drills against the wall, but despite that, it would take over 12 hours in certain areas to make it wide enough. Other teams were tasked with bringing medical supplies to Harry's location, but this also proved more difficult than anticipated. Because some areas were so tight, the cavers had to climb over each other to pass by. Volunteers on the surface provided food and drink to keep everyone's spirits high. Eventually, the doctor, with help, managed to get Harry on a stretcher. However, at this point, Harry was becoming confused and would have small periods where he would go unresponsive. After about an hour of Harry on the stretcher, they got the signal to traverse the first pitch. The cavers attached the stretcher to the heavy rigging system and began the process of moving him out of the cave. They made good progress and all seemed to be going well. The ropes were holding and the stretcher was moving. At the halfway point of the rescue, Harry lost consciousness and was entering cardiac arrest. The team had to place Harry on the ground while the doctor administered CPR for about a minute before Harry was brought back to life. They paused for a few hours to let Harry stabilize so they could plan out their next steps. It was well into the night and it did not seem like Harry was improving. He looked pale in the face and was not responsive to his rescuers. At about 10 p.m., they realized they had no other option than to continue. The cavers attached his stretcher to the rigging system and continued the grueling process of moving him out of the cave. The rescue team moved quickly and it seemed to be going fairly well. Harry was eerily quiet, almost like he was holding on to his last breath. As they were lifting him out of the cave, Harry went into cardiac arrest again. He was so weak that little could be done. Given the location of the stretcher, it was not reasonable to lower him to the ground and administer CPR. The only option was to continue to lift him to the surface. Unfortunately, Harry would die on top of the same pitch from where he fell. Everyone was devastated. 
as this was a huge blow to the morale. However, the rescuers continued to remove Harry's body from the cave. He would have to be taken off the stretcher multiple times to fit through some of the more narrow passageways. It became clear that the only way Harry could have gotten out of that cave was if he was in a condition where he could help himself. The news of Harry's passing was relayed to the surface. Because this was now a body recovery, they were able to use specialized equipment packing Harry into an enclosed stretcher. As they moved him through the cave, diggers continued making space up until the point where the stretcher would reach them. At 5 a.m., Harry was finally lifted out of the cave. The entire rescue attempt took over 17 and a half hours, with many of the cavers citing it was the most difficult extraction they had ever been a part of. Hundreds of pounds of equipment had been carried in and out of the cave, with some of it breaking along the way. The 90 volunteers involved spent a combined total of 1,626 hours in the rescue attempt. The cause of death was ruled to be hypothermia and hypovolemic shock caused by his left femur fracture. Harry's daughter would come out and thank all of the rescuers for their efforts as well as state that Harry was a loving man and a true caver till the end. Harry was put to rest 10 days later. Despite his experience and knowledge about caving, this story is a reminder that anyone can become a victim when deep underground. After breaking his leg, it was unlikely that Harry would survive, but he kept fighting until the very end. If the cave had not been so tight, or even if it had been mapped, the outcome may have been different but it was just not meant to be. On January 18, 2020, Christine Gauci was in a state of panic in an underwater cave in the picturesque water of Malta. The 35-year-old technical diver, scuba instructor, free diver, and Afghanistan veteran had trapped her scuba fin into a fishing net, and her longtime dive partner, Arthur Castillo, was desperately trying to free her. What happened next left many unanswered questions, and the case only got more perplexing when Arthur Castillo would be charged with involuntary homicide subsequent to a comprehensive post-accident analysis conducted by the Maltese police. This story may have the most twists, turns, and controversies we've ever covered on this channel. This is the story of Christine Gauci. Our story begins on a small archipelago located in the central Mediterranean Sea named Malta. While Malta is one of the smallest nations in the world, it is also one of the most densely populated. It is only 122 square miles or 316 square kilometers, and it is entirely made up of sedimentary rock and is dominated by one thing. You guessed it, water. The history of the island is filled with conflict. It was a major battleground for war within the Mediterranean Sea, but today, the 500,000 residents live a peaceful life. There are two islands that make up the nation, the larger island of Malta and the smaller Gozo. The larger island is more developed today and boasts a greater number of attractions, while Gozo offers a more relaxed and natural feel. With water surrounding the two islands, it has become a hot spot for tourists, as there are many sightseeing, scuba diving, or even cave diving areas. And this is why Christine Gauci would become infatuated with being in the water at such a young age. Born on September 3rd, 1985, Christine was described as a sincere, energetic, and adventurous woman. She grew up always interested in spending her free time outside exploring and just simply enjoying the outdoors. In 2005, she shattered expectations by becoming the sole woman accepted into Malta's elite armed forces. Despite facing a setback due to a knee injury during basic training, her determination prevailed. After recovering, Christine pushed through and successfully completed the recruitment process, but she wasn't done. Setting her sights even higher, she aspired to serve in the British Army. After enduring a challenging six-month selection process in the UK, she excelled in basic training, specializing in air defense. Christine's training led her to the Minden Battery 12th Regiment Royal Artillery, where she honed her skills and would climb the ranks. Her dedication and expertise earned her a deployment to Afghanistan 2011, where she proudly received the prestigious Afghanistan Medal for completion of her tour of duty. Upon returning to 
to Malta in 2012 after her deployment, she re-enlisted in the armed forces of Malta. Facing a fresh set of challenges, Christine took on responsibilities at Malta International Airport, which included training and compass searches on female personnel and vehicles, VIP protection, and rapid response to aircraft incidents. But something was missing. You see, Christine desperately wanted to use her talents and abilities in the one place she felt most comfortable the water. Because of her passion for diving, she nurtured a strong desire to embark on a career in underwater bomb disposal. But there was one problem. She would have to pass the incredibly demanding B3 diving course offered by the Explosive Ordnance Depot. If she were to pass, she would etch her name into history again, as she would become the first female member of the esteemed EOD unit. On the crisp morning of January 18th, 2020, Christine would meet up with her longtime dive partner, Arthur Castillo, on the south side of Gozo, in a bay called Gear 9 Zinni. She had driven south along a windy road overlooking the valley until she reached a small clearing near the edge of the water, a perfect parking spot, as it was close enough to carry their gear easily to the edge of the bay. The duo would then meet up with the rest of their group, consisting of four divers, bringing the total number to six. The water that morning was calm and absolutely breathtaking. It looked like a postcard that you send your buddy while on vacation. The plan was to follow the slope of the bay until they reached the open sea. The slope starts gently at 6 meters, then 10, 14, and eventually 70 meters. After reaching the sea, they would swim west to the Tarshan Temple sinkhole and then swim through two small ocean caverns that were often visited by divers. But before beginning the trek into the water, Christine would admit to Arthur that she had been awake for 24 hours preceding the dive due to a long work shift. For that reason, Arthur's girlfriend had attempted to talk her out of the dive, but Christine dismissed the suggestion, stating that she had completed many dives after a night shift before, and the cold water would revitalize her senses. At around 8.30 a.m., the group would set out, with Arthur pairing up with Christine as her dive buddy, something they had done many times before. Christine was equipped with an open-circuit back-mounted double and a decompression tank of 50% oxygen, while Arthur was diving a closed-circuit rebreather. They were planning mandatory decompression stops during the approximately 28-meter or 92-foot dive. The most concerning factor of the dive was that Christine was using a dry suit that was too big for her, causing it to trap too much much air, meaning buoyancy could become a problem. On top of this, Christine had not been trained on how to use a dry suit and was simply unfamiliar with it, but none of these factors would stop her. Arthur and Christine would grab their gear and make their way into the water, walking into the bay off the gradual slope. Almost immediately after the dive started, the issues would begin. Between 16 to 18 meters, Christine was already struggling with her buoyancy, and Arthur would have to dump gas, which means he would assist in removing the excess air that was building in her dry suit. This would improve her buoyancy for a short period of time, but it was more of a band-aid fix rather than a real solution. This was why Arthur would recommend they abort the dive at this depth, but Christine would quickly signal for them to continue. After arriving at a depth of 28 meters, Arthur would once again have to assist Christine by holding her down and releasing gas from her buoyancy device. Now when someone typically experiences buoyancy issues on a dive, it doesn't just magically go away. In fact, it typically only worsens throughout the dive. After reaching their target depth of 28 meters, the duo would make their way over to a small cave, but after swimming through, Christine's scuba fin would become entangled in a small fishing net. Christine, being an expert diver, understood that she had to remain calm, but what made this difficult was how much she was struggling with her buoyancy. After getting her flipper entangled, she began to panic because she knew that being in a cave was very different from open water. The walls, the silt, the lack of light, all of these factors made her situation more dangerous. Arthur would slowly make his way over to Christine and signaling for her to remain calm, he would slowly pull out a small knife and begin cutting away at the net. Within minutes, Christine was free. Once again, Arthur would signal they end their dive, but Christine was set on continuing. Following the exit from the cave, Arthur directed that they should ascend to a shallower depth for the return swim to shore, but as they arrived at 15 meters or 49 feet, Christine would once again suffer buoyancy issues. She was struggling to stay in depth because her suit was filling with air. This meant she felt like she was being dragged towards the surface. 
but without the proper decompression stops, Christine could put herself into serious danger, as the nitrogen that has accumulated in her blood would not be able to dissolve. Basically, if she could not control her buoyancy, she could lose her life. Arthur would remove two kilogram weights from his own suit and attach it to Christine to help, but it would prove to be insufficient. In a last ditch effort, Arthur would wrap his arms around a heavy rock, lift it, then hand it to Christine. Finally, after she took the rock, Arthur expressed the need to end the dive, but it seemed even with his added urgency, Christine was still set on continuing. What happened next is unclear, but Arthur would look away from Christine for a few seconds, and after he looked back at where she was just moments before, she was gone. He watched as the rock she had been holding plummeted to the ocean floor but he could do nothing. Arthur would immediately begin his ascent with the intention of completing a two minute mandatory decompression stop at five meters. However, that proved impossible due to him giving Christine two of his weights. Once Arthur surfaced, he would spot another diver exiting the water and wearing a similar dry suit to his own. He immediately let out a sigh of relief thinking it was Christine, but after swimming towards them, his heart sunk. It was not his diving partner. After arriving on shore, another diver would ask Arthur about Christine, and that is when his suspicion would be confirmed. She had not returned. They would wait five minutes, and then they would call the emergency number. There was a group of divers already on the surface, so rescue efforts would kick off immediately. Some divers swimming back into the bay, while others began walking along the water's edge, looking for any sign of Christine. According to an expert witness, the assumption that Christine was safe on the surface and swimming back to shore, when no such contact and reasoning was made between the two divers, proved to be highly significant, as this led to the omission of a timely rescue attempt during the critical initial minutes. It didn't take long until they found her. Christine was noticed floating face down by the shore. After removing her body from the water, they would notice that she had bloodshot eyes and blood frothing from her mouth. It was noted that there was no air left in her tanks. The exact circumstances of her passing would remain a mystery, but there were three theories. Insufficient weighting or decompression, gas depletion that would have forced an emergency ascent, or as highlighted by an expert, a cardiac arrhythmia might have triggered a sudden shortness of breath, compelling Christine to instinctively ascend rapidly to the surface in search of air. After her death, Arthur would be immediately investigated and charged with involuntary homicide. Despite several attempts by Arthur to help Christine during the dive, the magistrate of Gozo wrote that he had failed to provide appropriate assistance during the final part of the dive. It was learned that Arthur had failed to check Christine's gas levels during the last 25 minutes of the dive, and he had even witnessed her grasping her nitrox 50% decompression cylinder towards the end of the dive, but had not investigated her behavior. Because of this, Arthur would be found guilty, meaning he would be held responsible for Christine's death. Arthur's conviction would understandably create outrage within the diving community, with many blogs and articles discussing the events and stating that this would create a precedent that would lead other divers to consider diving without buddies for fear of being punished for a mistake. But there was no community that was more hurt than the Maltese scuba divers. The events would obviously affect tourism and scuba diving in the area, but I think we can all agree that one of those hurt the most is Arthur. An experienced diver would lose his friend, right in front of his eyes, after he had made several attempts to help her, then be convicted for her death. On February 22, 2023, the Court of Criminal Appeals would review Arthur's case, and they would eventually clear him of all criminal responsibility for Christine's death, ruling that he had done everything he could have reasonably been expected to do in the circumstances. In her ruling, Justice Consuelo Herrera said that while the buddy system was used by divers to ensure assistance was available during a dive, it did not mean that divers are responsible for each other's actions. Justice Herrera ruled that Arthur had not been an any way negligent in his actions, and said that arterial narrowing, which was discovered during Christine's autopsy, was not foreseeable. The court also noted, while Arthur had come to Christine's aid several times during the dive, had he tried to follow her during the final rapid ascent, there may have been two fatalities, not one.
This decision rapidly made its way through the diving community, leaving a sigh of relief in its wake. Many thought this was the correct decision, and while Arthur was not perfect, charging him for involuntary homicide felt like a stretch to the community. Arthur would watch his friend die in front of him, then be faced with defending his own life. At the end of the day, there really is no winners in the story. Someone's name was dragged through the mud, and a diver lost her life, something that nobody can ever change. Best friends and experienced cave divers Wang Dao and Wang Yong were diving in Zhuding Cave in Duan Zhang Zhao, where they would find themselves faced with an impossible situation. They had just reached a depth of 166 meters, or 544 feet, and had begun their ascent to the surface. But there was a problem. Wang Dao had only one minute of oxygen left. This is their story. In southern China's tranquil countryside sits Duan. The gorgeous hills and crystal clear rivers offer a sharp contrast to the vibrant megacities that characterize China. The area attracts divers from all over the country with its breathtaking scenery and underwater caves, offering some of the most beautiful formations in the world. The region is home to over 6,200 miles or 10,000 kilometers of underground rivers that carve passageways through the limestone rock. Duan has strong fluctuating seasonal water levels, with variations up to 40 meters or 130 feet between its dry and wet seasons. This of course impacts water flow and visibility, but as you can imagine, can create unique and vast cave systems. Some of the deepest known caves in the area exceed 230 meters or 750 feet in depth. Because of the fluctuating water levels, it is best to dive only in certain months, those being April to May or October to November. Access to these caves is challenging, to say the least, as most are located in rural mountainous areas with no cellular reception or GPS navigation. Typically, one must rely on guides from the surrounding area to navigate the terrain and to find the hidden entrances. The caves vary in size from small to rather large, featuring stunning stalactites and stalagmites, while deeper passageways have smooth walls carved by water flow from thousands of years ago. Wang Dao and Wang Yang first dived Zhudin in 2010 and were immediately captivated by the cave's beauty. The aquatic plants, unique cave structure, and the cold water that continuously emerges from the ground attracted the duo time and time again. Over the years, they gradually increased their depth. Wang Yang states that the underwater tunnel attracted the men to go deeper and deeper with each dive. On their fifth dive of Juden, they managed to reach 122 meters, or 400 feet. On each dive, they would try to find connecting horizontal passageways that could be explored. In March of 2014, French cave diver Pascal, who at the time held the record for the deepest dive in the world, extended the line in Zhudin to an astounding 160 meters or 520 feet. Once Wang Yong and Wang Dao learned of this, they became extremely motivated to match the feet. The duo would reach out to Pascal and learn everything they could about this deep dive in preparation for their own attempt. Plans were set in motion and the equipment needed was quickly gathered. The duo, along with Zhao Pei, a rescue diver who accompanied the men in case of emergencies, would all arrive at the cave on April 15th. Over the next two days, they practiced their routine, monitored the cave conditions, and prepared over 20 cylinders needed for the dive. By April 18th, the men were ready. After successful completion of their surface equipment tests, the duo entered the water around 2.30 p.m. They planned to follow the one-third rule of diving, which meant that one-third of the gas supply was estimated for the descent, one-third for the return journey, and the last third in case of emergencies. The water temperature was right around 19 degrees Celsius, or 66 degrees Fahrenheit, and the flow, by most standards, would have been considered weak, meaning they would have an easy time navigating the cave. Wang Yang led the way as they descended quickly with no issues. At 75 meters, they switched to the first stage cylinders and kept moving. The cave is structured as an inclined channel, almost like stairs leading deep into the abyss. At 100 meters, the men experience a low visibility area and had to rely on the guide rope to keep descending. At 120 meters, the visibility improved to about 3 meters. 
the men greeted each other and gave the okay signal to continue. At 150 meters, they switched to their second set of cylinders and were almost at their goal. Once they reached 164 meters, the men stopped and Wang Dao began arranging arrows on the guide rope. They both felt slightly disoriented due to the depth, but it was not enough to affect their decision making. All of their visual checks indicated that the situation was normal. Their total descent time was 21 minutes. After spending one minute at 164 meters, Wang Yang indicated to start their long ascent that would be filled with many planned decompression stops. But at the 130 meter mark, the guide rope that the men had been following was no longer tied to their previous knot. With their visibility only being two meters, the reality of their situation began to set in. It was hard for both men to not feel the early stages of panic. Wang Yang's heart instantly dropped and he remembered feeling ice cold in his chest. Wang Dao looked at him nervously, but there was no time to think. They both took action and began searching using the terrain around them. And after two minutes, they managed to find the rope as relief washed over them. At this time, Wang Yang realized his second cylinder was out of oxygen, so he transitioned to his main tank and started to ascend. They made their way up to 120 meters when Wang Yang felt a slight tug. Turning around, he saw that Wang Dao was stuck under a protruding rock pointing his flashlight at his neck, a primary indicator that he was running out of oxygen. Wang Yang was surprised at just how quickly Wang Dao's gas had been consumed, but both divers remained calm as Wang Yang unfolded his long throat and the two of them began breathing symbiotically. Their air pressure at the time was only 130 psi, which Wang Yang estimated would only support two nervous divers at their depth for only three to four minutes. A diver's tank on average can hold up to 3,000 psi, and the general rule of thumb is that if you are below 200, then it is time to surface. Realizing the predicament that they were in, Wang Yang gave the sign to ascend quickly. As they needed to make it to 75 meters where additional cylinders were stored, he grabbed the guideline with his left hand and Wang Dao grabbed the line with his right hand. They began to rise rapidly, which caused both divers to become confused. Wang Yang was struggling to remain conscious as the effects of decompression sickness became overwhelming. At 90 meters, Wang Yang took his hand off the guide rope and gripped the rock next to him. With his other hand, he used his flashlight to look at his depth. The remaining air pressure in the cylinder both divers were using was about 40 psi. But since they were only 15 meters away from their stored canister, this wasn't really a worry. Wang Yang started to feel more relieved, feeling like they were almost out of this nightmare. When he turned sideways and saw his longtime friend Wang Dao floating upward, instinctively Wang Yang reached out to grab him, but it was too late. He was out of reach. Within a second, Wang Dao was out of sight. and panicked and knowing he had to act quickly, Wang Yang rapidly ascended 10 meters, but could not spot Wang Dao anywhere. His visibility was extremely low, so his options were limited. Not wanting to let go of the guide rope, Wang Yang frantically searched the area around him, extending his arm in all directions. At this point, the effects of rising too rapidly were playing tricks on Wang Yang's mind. As he felt like he was dreaming, he took a deep breath closed his eyes and shook his head violently, almost like he was trying to remove the cloud that obscured his mind. He checked his air pressure again and saw that only 20 psi remained. Wang Yang made his way over to the location where their extra cylinders were stored and quickly transferred over to a new tank. Once he felt more secure, he realized the seriousness of the matter. The feeling of isolation was overwhelming and Wang Yang desperately wanted to find his friend. He immediately covered his own light to see if Wang Dao's light was shining, but he only saw darkness. The cave was silent and the familiar rocks around him no longer felt the same. He would search around for a few minutes with only one thought in his mind, find Wang Dao. His current cylinder of gas would not allow Wang Yang to return to greater depths. He grabbed the extra cylinder stationed at this location. The tank was a tri-mix of oxygen, helium, and nitrogen that allows divers to reach deeper locations. Instead of returning to the surface, Wang Yang started descending again, first to 80 meters, then to 90. His vision was becoming blurry, and it was harder to remain conscious. Being an expert diver, he knew that he was experiencing oxygen poisoning, but he just didn't care. Yang thought that if he convulsed and died, at least he would be joining his friend. 
His heart was pounding in his chest and every thump rang in his ears. Then all of a sudden, he fainted. It was only for a second, but it was enough for his instincts to take over and he quickly rose to the 50 meter mark. In the process, multiple decompression stops were skipped as it was impossible for him to remain calm. Wang Yang thought to himself if he could at least reach their support diver, then maybe, just maybe, he could help. He continued rising until he reached 21 meters where Xiao Pei met him. Xiao Pei was extremely surprised that Wang Yang was alone and screamed at him underwater. Once Wang Yang confirmed that he had been separated from his diving partner, Xiao Pei dove down following the rope trying to find any traces of Wang Dao. No longer feeling alone, Wang Yang felt less nervous, but after a minute, at 21 meters, the effects of decompression sickness became extreme. He felt like his entire body was in a tornado, constantly spinning. His legs and joints were in extreme pain as the rapid rise caused nitrogen gas and helium bubbles to expand in his body. Zhao Pei returned and realized that Wang Yang desperately needed help to decompress. They returned to 36 meters and the pain became less and less. Zhao Pei, still wanting to look for Wang Dao, began searching around them, but Wang Yang signaled for him to stop and help. He felt on the verge of death and realized without assistance, he could not make it back to the surface. The pair slowly rose, moving only a few meters at a time before stopping to decompress. Wang Yang was falling in and out of consciousness and could no longer control his own body. At six meters, he was completely out of it. Zhao Pei would switch him over to pure oxygen, and after more than an hour, would wake up Wang Yang. They returned to the surface, and immediately, Wang Yang could describe what happened and for Zhao to make a distress call. The duo would return to the water, where Wang Yang remained for another 30 minutes until the pain in his arms had finally subsided. The total decompression time took 150 minutes, which was 40 minutes faster than their original plan. Zhao would drag Wang Yang out of the water and carry him to the side of a nearby road where an ambulance would take him to a hospital. The local government was notified and a French diving team would be asked to search for Wang Dao. However, due to the preparation needed, they would not make the dive until the following morning. Wang Yang would experience dizziness and vomiting for an entire day as well as muscle soreness and swollen blood vessels. But after two hyperbaric oxygen chambers, his condition would finally stabilize. Wang Dao's body was found the next morning at the 51 meter mark, but due to the cave structure, it is believed that the current carried him to this location. He was found with his mask on his face, no regulator in his mouth, and without any signs of a struggle. A technical analysis of the accident revealed multiple factors contributing to Wang Dao's tragic fate. Stress-induced rapid breathing, carbon dioxide buildup, and increased nitrogen narcosis, gas planning, overconfidence, lack of a sufficient support team, failure to rehearse the stage bottle sequence, and not following a gradual approach were all identified as crucial errors. Wang Yang and Wang Dao's unfortunate experience serves as a stark reminder of the challenges and risks associated with deep cave diving, the need for thorough preparation, conservative gas planning, and mental readiness cannot be understated. Wang Dao's memory lives on in the hearts of his diving friends in the diving community. It was just under 80 degrees Fahrenheit on July 6, 2015, which meant it was the perfect weather for hiking and sightseeing. And there are a few other better places to do that in Washington state other than the big four ice caves. Annalisa Santana and her brother, David, would be visiting from California and among the crowd that would flock to the trail and eventually the caves to enjoy the perfect weather. The warm weather had begun in May, and by July, the rising temperatures would unfortunately cause a chain of events that would tragically change the lives of both siblings. This is their story. The Big Four Ice Caves lie in the northwest of Washington State, just an hour and 30 minute drive from Seattle, and for a state that lies just under Canada, 
you would think the temperatures would be cold, and they are compared to other areas of the United States. But because the Pacific Ocean is so close, there is not a large variability between temperatures, with summer months rarely getting above 80 degrees Fahrenheit and winter months dipping into the 30s at night. So when temperatures do start to hit the 70s and 80s, well, it's time for residents to get out and view the beautiful outdoors. While most people know of Mount Rainier, and for good reason, there are plenty of other trails and sights to see throughout the state. The ice caves lie at the bottom of an avalanche chute on the Big Four Mountains north face. This is a small indentation where snow and water has eroded a path through the rock face, creating a pool of ice at the bottom. The melting snow and wind from avalanches has formed the 3,100 feet of caverns that are maintained year-round due to the shade of the mountain. The caves are unique and that the temperature is enough to dislodge and begin to melt pieces of the cave, creating new offshoots and structures within the ice. But every winter, a new round of snowfall only adds to the structure. It is a never-ending cycle of melting snow and ice to be replenished year after year. To reach one of Washington's most iconic outdoor attractions, you would begin a hike through the trailhead with a very unique name, the Big Four Ice Caves Trail. It is considered an easy hike and is just over 2.3 miles round trip. Therefore, there is lots of foot traffic year round. The entire hike takes roughly 30 minutes to reach the caves and 30 minutes back to the parking lot. And there is no cell reception throughout the entire trip, meaning there really is no way to reach the outside world. If you were hiking the trail today, you would come across countless warning signs to stay out of the caves. Warning signs that were missing from their original location in 2010, when John Tam and Tamami Okaoki visited the caves with their two kids. Similar to 2015, the temperature was warm in 2010, and this would cause a large chunk of ice the size of a small truck to break away from the primary structure. This chunk of ice would sadly strike 11-year-old Grace Tam. Grace was standing 20 feet away from the cave and waiting for her parents to take a photo when she was struck. Unfortunately, she would lose her life later that day. Grace's family in the state of Washington would establish a memorial and ensure plenty of warning signs were correctly established to prevent any tragic accidents to occur ever again. But of course, even with the signs, every year there are hundreds, if not thousands of individuals that enter the caves. And for a California family visiting the caves in July of 2015, this case was no different. 34-year-old Annalisa Santana, her four children, and fiancé Dustin Wilson were accompanied by Annalisa's 25-year-old brother, David Santana, as they visited the state of Washington for a family vacation. David was also married and had two children with a third on the way. Annalisa and David had spent the early years of their lives in Washington and had some great memories of the state and simply exploring the outdoors. Annalisa desperately wanted to share her memories of the state with her children and give them the opportunity to create their own. While on vacation, the family had heard multiple times from the residents of the state that the Big Four ice caves were absolutely worth the drive, as there is simply nothing like the caves. Because of all the recommendations and all the great info online, it was a no-brainer for Annalisa and David to make the trip with their family. Those of you with kids can certainly understand just how difficult they can be at times, but taking four on a two-mile hike, even if it is considered an easy hike. Yeah, I'm not sure I would want to be in those shoes. But even so, Annalisa thought it was a great opportunity for her family to bond and see the caves together. So after roughly 30 minutes of walking, they finally came into view. The caves stand out as the white texture contrasts against the giant rock that it lies against, especially in the summer when it is the only ice and snow around. At the base of the structure are several caves that quickly disappear into the darkness of the ice. And of course, they couldn't help but notice all the people. There were individuals climbing onto the ice and walking into the caves, even though there are plenty of signs that directly warn against this. As Annalisa and David approached the caves with their family, it was easy to be influenced by the sheer number of people entering the ice. So after taking a couple of pictures from the outside, they would make the decision to enter the structure. The first thing they noticed was the blue ice and the beauty of the cave from the inside. They also felt a deep chill that 
could be felt in their bones, causing some to even physically shiver, as the caves were much colder than the warm temperatures outside. From the outside, everything was normal. There were still plenty of hikers heading towards the caves from the trail, and many people stopping to take pictures at the entrance of the cave. But as we have become accustomed to in many of the stories on my channel, in some cases, everything can be fine one minute, and the next, all hell can break loose. Those outside heard it first. It was a faint crack that rippled through the air. Then they felt the ground shake as suddenly chunks of ice, some as big as large trucks, began falling from the roof and smashing into the rocks below, ice and snow flying in all directions on impact. It was over almost as quickly as it came, and the ice had once again settled. Because of the rising temperatures that started in May, the ice had become thinner and thinner as it slowly melted until suddenly it was no longer strong enough to hold. An entire shelf of snow and ice would fall on July 6th. Inside the cave, Annalisa and David would be exploring with their families when they heard the crack, but there was nothing that they could do. Both families, along with several other tourists in the cave, would quickly try to take cover, covering their heads with their arms as they tried to duck behind any rocks they could reach. But unfortunately, there just wasn't enough time. Annalisa was hit by a large slab of ice, and she would lose her life almost immediately. Her brother David would be standing near her and be hit as well, nearly knocking him unconscious. As those who were lucky and uninjured began looking up, the first thing everyone noticed was the sheer amount of ice now on the floor of the cave. Then it would be the few people who still lay on the ground, screaming in pain because of a broken bone or other injury. But the scariest sight was those not making a sound. There were several people unconscious and even more who were injured. Annalise's fiance, Dustin, had injured his leg, but along with several others was helped out of the cave with David and Annalise's four children, but they would be missing one family member. Because of no cell reception, it was difficult to inform anyone, much less rescue teams, as it would take a couple of hikers over 30 minutes till they would reach their vehicle, then another 14 minutes to reach a phone where they could let officials know of the accident. As we commonly see in these types of stories, those first few minutes after the accident are absolutely crucial, and waiting 45 minutes after the cave collapsed could quite literally be the difference between life and death. To put it simply, it is a failure by the state to not have a closer emergency phone. A rescue helicopter would be sent to the cave shortly after the call came in, and their first life flight would be David Santana, who was barely conscious after suffering from blunt force trauma. Dustin and all four of Annalise's children would make their way to the hospital as well. Dustin would have to have leg surgery, but thankfully, along with Annalise's kids, they would all five make a full recovery. I wish I could say the same about David, as he would battle in critical care for three months before he too would pass away from his injuries. David would leave behind his wife, and three kids. Annalisa and David were both described as caring and loving people, especially when it came to their families. They were known for having huge hearts, and that can certainly be seen in the story, as all they wanted to do was genuinely give their kids memories that they could cherish forever, but everything can change in just one second. It would be two days before Annalise's body would be removed from the back of the caves, and it was a tedious process as rescue teams had to be wary of another collapse, but thankfully, there were no more accidents. The Big Four Ice Caves would be closed for months as the state reassessed how they would keep the public safe. Eventually, they would begin the process of installing closer emergency landlines to the cave, so if there ever was another collapse, rescue teams could reach the caves significantly quicker. They also established even more warning signs telling tourists to stay out of the caves. But since it is not illegal to enter, to this day there are still thousands of hikers every single year that roll the dice. I know the state can only do so much, but this still feels like a failure to me, as two innocent lives were lost and families were changed forever, yet the changes, while needed, are simply just not severe enough to prevent another accident from ever happening again. While I wish that on nobody, unfortunately, I see it as only a matter of time.
In 1967, there was not too much excitement to be had in a small Missouri town called Hannibal. But what they did have was an extensive dry caving system to explore named Murphy's Cave. This cave system was a beacon to all young explorers and avid outdoorsmen from the area as it would provide a muddy day of entertainment and excitement, except for the one day that it didn't. Today, I have a story unlike any other that I have covered on this channel, a story that to this day is still not solved. Three boys on May 10th, 1967 would enter Murphy's Cave and vanish, never to be seen again. This is their story. May 9th would start off as any normal day did for the Hogue family. Parents would wake the children up to eat breakfast together before the two boys, Joel, age 13, and Billy, age 11, would have to go to school. As the family ate and discussed their plans for the day, Mrs. Hogue would remind the boys that construction was taking place on the highway that they were to avoid. Oh, and to make sure that they stayed away from that cave. Work crews were using dynamite in the surrounding area which was creating new openings in Murphy's cave, but also causing cave-ins. Of course, as all young boys do, they nodded their head and smiled, saying yes, mother, while secretly casting glances at each other. As the day progressed, the boys' anticipation and excitement grew as they had a secret plan that they hid from their parents. Both Hogue boys would meet up with Craig Dowell, age 14, and their friend, also an avid young explorer. It was quickly agreed upon that after school, the boys would get together and attempt to enter Murphy's Cave. This would not be the first time the Hogue boys entered Murphy's Cave. In fact, they had some experience as they would occasionally explore its depths together, despite the wishes from their parents. Once school ended, the boys would head home, eat with their families, and then meet up again. The boys played it off as if they were just going to go play with some friends, but had to hide their flashlights in fear of being discovered by their parents. After sunset, the Hogues and Daniel managed to find an unknown entrance of the cave, but did not make it far inside, only just enough to wet their appetites and cover their clothes in a reddish mud color that was common when exploring Murphy's cave. Soon after the boys entered, construction workers spotted the flashlights in the distance and called out to them, but not wanting to get caught, all three boys would sprint home, making it safely back that night. When they returned, it was apparent where the boys had been. Each one would receive a stern lecture from their parents, but it did little to sway them. The desire to explore remained. Due to their shenanigans the night before, on May 10th, the Hogue boys would be grounded. Mrs. Hogue instructed Joel and Billy that they would only be allowed to play in the family yard that day, where she could keep an eye on both of them. But their parents' words went in through one ear and out the other. Nevertheless, May 10th started off just like May 9th. The boys would attend school, but today were told to head straight home. To their credit, they did follow instructions and after school, did exactly as they were told. However, today was grocery day, and both Mr. and Mrs. Hogue would head to the store an hour or two after Billy and Joel got home. Both boys watched their parents get in the car and drive off. They quickly grabbed their flashlights and headed to Craig's house, where they soon met up with their friend and would begin their nightly adventures. The clock was a little past two as the boys began walking towards the cave entrance. They had a few flashlights, a lantern, a shovel, and even built a small makeshift ladder for the trickier passages. One that did not look like it could hold much weight, but again these were children. And as the hours progressed, so did the boys. And around 3pm, all three were spotted near the entrance of Murphy's cave by a neighbor of the Hogs passing by. The glow of a lantern could be seen, illuminating in the distance as the boys disappeared into the rocks. But nobody realized at the time that this would be the last time the three boys would ever be seen. Mr. and Mrs. Hogue pulled into their driveway around 5.30pm. The minute they arrived, something felt off. It was evident the boys disobeyed instructions and left. But both parents were more worried about where they were going. As their flashlights and clothes were missing, it became apparent what they were up to. Both parents were furious, but little could be done at the moment, so they sat and waited, and waited, and waited, until eventually it was well past dinner time, and the sinking feeling of helplessness mixed with worry was palpable in the air. Something was not right. Understandably, and in a state of panic, Mrs. Hogue called the local authorities and explained the situation. Thankfully, they were taken seriously, and a small search party was quickly made and dispatched, which consisted of a small group of authorities and spelunkers. 
The most logical place for the boys to be would be in the cave, so that is where the search began. But this provided more challenges than originally anticipated due to the ongoing construction. There was massive amounts of undiscovered cave that had been exposed as well as passages that were known and had been sealed, creating a general confusion with all those that were familiar with the layout of Murphy's Cave. The night progressed with no luck, and as authorities ventured deeper and deeper into the subterranean caverns, flashing their lights, calling out for an answer, nobody answered back. Eventually, the search ended that night, and the Hogues were more panicked than ever. They would not sleep that night, as every moment would be an agonizing thought of their sons. Another day passed, and just like the last, nothing new was found or reported. There was a remaining hope among the search team that the boys would show up out of the ground with smiles on their faces, but as time progressed, this hope dwindled like the tiny wick of a candle ready to be extinguished. The search began to pick up traction at this point, spreading like wildfire throughout the local media and surrounding areas. It was not common for a small town to have missing children, much less three in one case. And naturally, it brought curious individuals to volunteer and want to step in to help. It was a welcoming sight, particularly for the Hogue and Dowell families, as they just wanted answers and to see their boys again. Because of the traction, national media began to run it in the papers as well, and pretty soon the story about three missing boys in Murphy's Cave, Missouri was known across the country. Volunteers began to travel across the U.S. to join in on the efforts. Amateur and professional cave explorers offered their services, with some being considered the best in the world. So many, in fact, that the cave was explored for 10 days straight, 24 hours a day. All the familiar passageways were quickly discovered to be empty, as they focused their search on any new caverns. But again, nothing was found. And at this point, the cave had experienced multiple cave-ins, and thus, it cannot be ruled out that the boys had been a victim of a passage that was recently closed. But it was impossible to know, which made the search that much more difficult. As the search continued into the cave, they began to expand to surrounding areas looking for any clues, which just so happened to include a nearby quarry. At this quarry, a small sock was found. It was just about the size of a young boy's sock, and would be the only piece of evidence that authorities claimed to have found up to this point. This brought hope to rescuers and only intensified the search, but a new question would be on everyone's mind with the discovery of the sock. Did the boys even make it into the cave? The option certainly had to be considered because there was no evidence to point otherwise and authorities had to think of all scenarios. Thus the search was expanded to the surrounding cave systems and after 10 excruciating days had passed, the only sign was that single sock. However, even this would eventually be a problem, as neither parents could say for certain that the sock found belonged to any one of the boys. It was a massive blow to the search effort, as that was the only remaining hope left. Murphy's cave had been thoroughly searched and a new map had been drawn. Eventually it was concluded that the boys could not be in the cave, unless they had been crushed under a cave-in, but there are many other theories on what could have happened. On top of that, a thorough investigation of the surrounding areas, including woods, houses, and caves, just about any other place imaginable was looked into, but nothing could be found that pointed to the boys' whereabouts, further puzzling authorities. They even tried to bring in psychics to help with the efforts, but to no avail. All avenues were explored. They received many anonymous leads, many being fake or dead ends, but there are a few promising paths to note. The most obvious explanation is already mentioned, a cave in the form of unstable conditions resulting in the death of all three boys. There had been multiple reports of an unknown hooded figure who had watched the search attempts but not help. This was during the time that serial killer John Wayne Gacy was actively causing terror, and thus it was considered that these three boys fell victim to the killer clown. However, I believe this to be highly unlikely, as one, John Gacy had to have been traveling through Hannibal that same night, which according to reports was possible, as he was in the area, but his killings were usually individuals and not a group. Maybe one of the most believed theories to have been discovered is that the whole situation was a cover-up for the Hogue family. The family had connections with the sheriff's office and department of transportation. This of course is all in theory and has never been proven. What kind of cover-up and for what reason is not mentioned, but I believe this avenue is theorized only because it is a simplistic but logical explanation from the current outcome. No matter what anyone believes, due to the national exposure, the search for the Hogue and Dowell boys turned into the largest cave search operation in American history. While there is not a specific number of individuals that helped, it was documented to be well over a few hundred. If anyone has any knowledge of the situation, please come forward.
a cold case to this day that remains unsolved. <laughs>